Um, thank you. Uh, Steve and I served on the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors for a good number of years, and like you said, uh, we did we agreed on more than we disagreed. Uh, but on occasion when we disagreed, it was uh, we agreed to disagree, and it was civil, and, and we maintained a good relationship and a good rapport. And I've always tried to live that way. Uh, I had other colleagues on the board that we differed politically, but we always maintain a good a, a civil environment and good relationships. Our, our families have met one another over the years, and that's what I love so much about local government and being here in the community. Now I'm in a slightly different world, a lot more partisan, a little bit different, but uh, Steve is always somebody who has represented his constituents extremely well and has uh, been a bridge builder and uh, I really appreciate him uh, for our many years uh, of service and I appreciate our friendship as well. Thank you Steve for your nice introduction. Um, in starting out I just realized my uh, few notes were a little bit out of order that's my fault. I wanted to thank uh, Katie uh, with ASL interpretation and uh, Regina who's doing Spanish uh, translation. Uh, for being here and uh, doing this wonderful service for us. I also want to thank the city of Santa Maria uh, for letting us use this wonderful facility, uh, this wonderful library, and also to our Santa Maria's finest, our Santa Maria Police Department. We have an officer here who is here uh, providing great service, so thank you very much for being here, officer. Uh, let me start by saying how happy that how happy I am to be hosting this in-person town hall meeting again. Uh, as you know, during the pandemic, we had very limited town halls. Uh, this is my fourth since last summer. Looking forward to your questions. Um, Washington is in the midst of a divided government, as you all know, but I have been there before. I focused on getting things done for you, delivering for the Central Coast, and trying to find opportunities to collaborate across the aisle when at all possible. Finding opportunities to work across the aisle in places where we agree. I recently introduced the Child Care Investment Act, uh, bipartisan legislation to lower the cost of child care. Also reintroduced the Protect Patriot Parents Act for the first time as a bipartisan bill to protect military families from forced separations. Despite, despite gridlock in the House, we are still able to focus on implementing the laws we created as part of our last term in Congress. A big one, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Did I say bipartisan? Which to date has delivered over half a billion dollars to our region. Uh, that's in new buses, highway improvements, road improvements, clean energy and clean water projects. And what does that mean? Jobs, jobs, jobs. The Inflation Reduction Act is another major piece of legislation that we moved forward this last term, which has helped lower inflation to its lowest rate in two years. We all know that over the past two years, uh, during the pandemic and right after, we had some serious inflation. We still have a little bit of that inflation. But right now, to date, it's the lowest it's been in two years. Healthcare savings are now capped out-of-pocket costs for seniors, uh, capped insulin prices, no more than $35 per month. Will someone pay for insulin before it was hundreds of dollars? Senior prescription drug costs are no more than $2,000 a year now which is a big deal. This is the largest climate investment in US history, which is clearly needed given the climate crisis seen on the news every night. And all this as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Other laws that we have passed, the PACT Act and the Chips and Science Act, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, and still more to do. The challenges lie ahead. The Many uh, across the aisle uh, that are extreme are calling the shots, unfortunately, in the House. 
and pushing for more abortion restrictions, even at the expense of our national security, more attacks on LGBTQ plus individuals, more culture wars in our classrooms, even calls for cuts for law enforcement and environmental pr uh, protection funding. I'm committed to raising your quality of life, our quality of life, lowering the cost of living, fostering new jobs and affordable housing, and I'm committed to ensuring you can have peace of mind living in our community, your community. Promoting public safety, getting guns and dangerous drugs off our streets. And I'm committed to defending your rights, protecting our right to vote and privacy, your freedom to be who you are and love who you want. And of course, the number one thing that I am very proud of that we do day in and day out my office, my team, many of my staff are here, is provide great constituent service. When you reach our office, uh, we are prompt in returning calls, emails, letters. Uh, every once in a while, we're not perfect, but for the most part, overwhelmingly, I think you will find that we provide extraordinary constituent service to all our constituents. And the reason today is so important to me is that I get to hear from you firsthand what I'm doing right, what you think I'm not doing right, what you think I should do more of, what are your concerns, what keeps you up at night, and what should I be doing in Congress to be a better representative. No one is perfect, but I will listen and I will do my best to try to be the best representative for you all. And with that, I think my team uh, has tried a, a and has a process by which we're gonna ask questions. You've already outlined that, and I believe people have already submitted questions, or are we handing out those at this point? Yeah, so you still have an opportunity to pass in your questions. Our first question, the first question for the evening will come from Jack Cherry. Jack, if you could raise your hand, and I can pass the mic over to you. And our second question is going to come from Andrew Oman. I just said the, the question I had was, how long do you think Obamacare will last if the Republicans win the White House next year? And if they do take it away, what would someone, think, what could someone do before they reach the age to qualify for Medicare or insurance? You know, I think that um, the Affordable Care Act has been adjudicated now quite a bit. Uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, made many attempts to get rid of it. And I think after set the late Senator McCain voted the way he did, along with uh, one of his colleagues from the other side of the aisle, I think it became pretty much permanent law. Now, as you know, Washington is fluid. Uh, depending which parties control uh, the House, the Senate, and the White House, if it's the trifecta, of course, there could be some day where that could be threatened or major policy could change. But I would say for the most part, uh, the Affordable Care Act is here to stay. And uh, I don't foresee it going away unless there's a real major change uh, in Washington and in representation. Okay, our next question is from Andrew. Critical services uh, continue to be threatened by the Trump era tax cuts and by tax cuts even before then. So, um, so when are we going to make corporations and top earners pay their fair share so we can actually protect our way of life and um, you know, try to have fewer people living in the streets and all of the other things that we're facing now? Well, as you know, um, there's been an effort to make sure that uh, those at the very top that earn the most pay their fair share. Not more than, but their fair share. And as a matter of fact, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, ensured that 
the entire legislation was paid for, uh, and not based on, um, it wasn't upside down. So in other words, those individuals at the very top were taxed, corporations were taxed a 15% increase in taxes, where in the past they were not paying a whole lot of taxes. And so there's already been an effort to right size and close the loops on individuals and corporations that were not paying their fair share of taxes. A lot more can be done, but to date there's been movement in that direction that has helped pay for the Inflation Reduction Act uh, piece of legislation. And there's always discussion on tax reforms that need to take place so that everybody is paying their fair share. And those discussions are gonna continue into the future because depending who controls Congress and who's in the White House, there's always discussions about what tax breaks are given, how they are paid for, and what kind of revenues come in and what kind of ex expenditures we're having. So it's part of a broader discussion, but I think there's been enough movement in the area to acknowledge that more needs to be done to make sure that everybody, corporations and individuals, pay their fair share of taxes, all individuals. We are having some technical difficulties with this mic, so I'll try on figuring that out but in the interim. Um, we had a similar question from Fred Lee and Fred Carbone regarding, um, I'd like to ask a question. Jeremy, can you I'm Fred, I guess that's not working. I'm Fred Carb, can you hear that? No. Yeah. I'm Fred Carbone, I can talk really loud. <laughs> um, you have a good, booming, booming voice. Yeah, it's just a natural, I just can't help myself. But I'm a, I'm a chiropractor, I've lived in Orchid for 30 years, and um, some of my healthiest, best patients have been patients that have been involved with the senior center that we've had in Orchid the entire time I've been there. These are people that after they retire, they don't want to just have a, a, an inactive lifestyle. They want to do things, they want to go places, they want to come back to the community and set and, and be servants to the community by, you know, building things for raffles and, and parking cars at the at the Elks and going to the different events and supporting all of our nonprofits in the area, right? So this is a huge piece of our community that has been so damn hard to try to get a new building built. Because in Orchid, we only have uh, unincorporated. It's like we, the most fees we've encompassed trying to build this new building have been fees from our damn county. You know, we're, we're two and a half million dollars in and we've spent money that people have donated just in county fees, right? And it's really hard to ask for some of our big donors to give more when they're just given to the program, right? And we really need a shot in the arm from the federal government to say, yes, yeah, senior aging matters. Having people be able to get together with their peers as they're older to support each other as they go through this time in life is really important. So, Salute, I want to know what you specifically can do to help us with that. Great. Well, first of all, there's a number of funding streams at the federal level that help su support senior programs. Some are through county government, some are through the state, and some are grants that are available to different programs to provide independent senior living, uh, to provide uh, senior, uh, for the lack of a better word, day centers that exist. And I think the reason the county charges fees, I'm not gonna defend the county, my colleague is here, is could you imagine if every nonprofit wanted to say, well, we're, we're a public interest, we, we can't pay. So they're trying to just be fair, but I understand the frustration of, of having to pay fees. Uh, sometimes it feels like, we're public interest too, give us a break. And I think they try, and, um, but in terms of what the federal government can do, uh, my staff and I will go back and look at a number of funding streams. I know there's uh, community project funding applications that come around once a year, uh, and that'll come around early next year again, and that's actually one way that uh, maybe the senior center can apply. And again, we get hundreds of those from the Central Coast. So based on criteria that we look at and geographic, <coughs> distribution, uh, there's a criteria by which uh, certain projects are selected. So what I would say is, look at community project funding applications, 
and then work with my office to see what grants and funding streams exist out there to assist uh, the ORCA Senior Center to see if there's any funding that might be helpful. Uh, Salute, I think we really need a shot in the arm for just legitimacy. We've got some big donors in our area that would be jumping in, but it's hard to do that when we don't have any anything behind, yes, it's actually gonna flop, yeah. okay? Fred, I certainly understand, but I will add you to the list of hundreds who have said they need a shot in the arm as well. But absolutely, I hear you loud and clear, we'll do what we can to give you information. Okay, our, ne our next question comes from Sasha Santos regarding oh. homelessness. Sasha, that's what we call my daughter. Her okay. name's not Tasha, we call her Sasha. Sasha I, know. I get Tasha too. Shauna, I get a whole bunch of different variations of my name. So, um, good evening. Uh, the homeless crisis is becoming worse in California, especially on the Central Coast. So how is this issue being addressed at the local and state level? Great. Well, I'm really glad you asked that. First, let me say that the federal government provides funding to the state and local governments in various forms, CDBG, uh, vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, uh, VASH vouchers for veterans, uh, various funding streams and grants. And we all try to work together to come up with programs and partnerships, private-public partnerships, that uh, address that challenge. And I think a lot of good work has been done, but sometimes it feels like not enough, right? And there's, we still see the challenge. Um, I'm proud to say that as part of the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan that we provided local governments money to do turnkey projects to help with address the issue of homelessness. And just the county of Santa Barbara, thanks to Supervisor Lavanino, they used some of those federal ARPA dollars as part of a broader project of, of funding streams to uh, develop Hope Village here in Santa Maria, that's gonna bring about 94 units to help people and families that are homeless. And that's just one example of many. There's also, there's also owls making sure that our families that are, on the, that are on the cusp of becoming homeless or need housing have access to stable housing. I'm proud that we were able to provide, for example, in Guadalupe, the Escalante Meadows uh, got uh, community project funding to help them in that project, I think it's People Self Help. Do I remember that? Is it People Self Help? Housing Authority. Housing Authority. Santa Barbara Housing Authority, County Housing Authority. They're developing that project. And um, again, we could always do more. We continue to work together. But this is a challenge that has challenged us all in government, federal, state, and local. We continue to do our share. And the locals are trying to do their share, working with a state and federal uh, dollars and partners. But we could always do more. But these are just some examples of success stories that I think are making a difference. And I know, I know exactly what you think. You know, you see so many people struggling. And whether you look at it from the standpoint of compassion or from the standpoint of nuisance, the bottom line is we need to do more to help house people. And I think the federal government is, is being as best partner as they can be. And we're working with Supervisor Lavanino and others and cities uh, to make sure that we can make that happen. All right, our next question tonight will come from Jane Baxter regarding clean water. And on deck we have Skip Harper. Hi, Jane. First, I'd like to say keep up the good work. That's my direction for tonight. Thank you. And, uh, Second is to uh, just share my concern with the lack of community interest we have here in yeah. water sustainability and water quality in the San Maria groundwater basin. We just don't seem to hear much about it, and thus we don't have much in the way of community involvement. This last year, I attended the annual meeting about the groundwater basin where the annual report was given. There were eight of us there. I was the only one concerned about water quality and water sustainability. And I think, uh, I personally feel it's time for 80-year-old activists such as myself to retire. So uh, if anyone seems to know where that group of young people are that's coming out to fill the void, let me know. I'd love to talk to some of them. 
So water quality is, is my uh, issue, as well as water sustainability. Since we're an adjudicated basin, we were not required, as most of California was, to deal with a water sustainability plan for this groundwater basin. So instead, we have uh, uh, two agencies, the Coastal Management Authority and our, our Water Conservation District, managing our water, but without much in the way of public input at all. And so one thing is, I haven't heard what the water uh, infrastructure projects are. I'd love to hear about that. And then also, I know it's a new issue. We haven't maybe been back long enough to dive in on all of these, but the grand jury has just recently released a report about our water conservation district and the management uh, concerns that they have. And it uh, certainly seems like there's some serious management issues there, you know, not sending out for competitive bidding and getting a contract worth of over a billion dollars over 10 years or whatever the specific figure was. And I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to read that grand jury report and what, from your perspective, uh, being our federal representative, uh, what might, what role might you play in helping work toward some solutions to the management problems we're having with the groundwater basin, which are very, as, as one of the uh, uh, employees said, you know, behind their hand the other night at a meeting, uh, water planning in Santa Maria is done in the dark. So, what might you do to throw some light at all of this? For starters, not to pass the buck. But uh, these water issues are local and state, as you know. Uh, state put forth Sigma for overdrafted regions and basins, and that's what you're seeing in Cuyama, for example. Um, Santa Maria water has been adjudicated, so there's a specific court uh, adjudication uh, plan that was put forth. Um, you know, water in California is quite unique. And while we are experiencing a drought, even though it feels like it got better, better because of the rains, um, there is always those questions of different basins. Uh, many of the water districts are either controlled by elected officials on the city council, Santa Maria, special districts, um, and they're the ones who make those decisions over water supply and making sure that they live up to state standards uh, so they don't have to be part of SIGMA, and which is those overdraft plans that need to be submitted to the state uh, when it comes to local governance. Of course, we have none, though, as a result of not having to go through SIGMA. We have no overdraft plan, we have no longer. But if you look at all those agencies, uh, what I wanted to say is that there's always an elected body of a special district or municipality that controls and has authority and responsibility for the decisions and issues that you're facing. So that's the first question that should always be raised. Who has jurisdiction and are the elected leaders over those specific bodies? So that's the number one question to help start providing you some of those answers. When it comes to federal water uh, funding, through uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law and perhaps some funding from the Inflation Reduction Act. I think a lot of the funding that comes uh, for water projects comes via the state. I know the state is looking at receiving some of those funds for their state water project uh, to see how that could augment their future project. And locally, it helps locals mostly in the area in the area of recycle. Um, for example, in the Five Cities area, there's a project, uh, multi-jurisdictions, multi-municipalities, that have gotten significant amount of funding uh, in a TIFIA loan to make sure that they're able to build the recycling of their sewer water, which would provide them an offset to the water that they use for drinking, or augmentation to that, should I say. So uh, if I could direct you to the elected bodies, they have decision making over those specific bodies of water, is number one. And number two, I will ask my staff to get, to 
help me provide you more information on the water projects that have been recipients of that, fe that federal funding here in the district. And I would just comment that the elected board that you're directing us to is the board that the grand jury just said is seriously mismanaged. So we've got a little bit of a problem there. Yeah, but and see, that's, that's a system we have. The grand jury provides a report, then the subject agency has to respond with a response, good or bad, and then it becomes up to the voters to say, are you doing a good enough job or not? And vote for them or not when they come up in the, uh, their upcoming re-elections. Except it's not coming to the public. They're all making uh, the last appointments of all them uh, done without public election. They have that option in their ruling. Well, that's probably because people don't run. Yeah. When people don't run, the Board of Supervisors or others have no option but to appoint those that are proposed or nominated or step forward. So it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite the challenge. But I really appreciate you raising this issue because I think it goes to underscoring the, how complicated water is in our region and how we have multiple jurisdictions and boards that overlap but have certain responsibility, but at the end of the day, they're elected representatives that every two, four years, there's an election. And the other board that manages things is, was created in the lawsuit that you made reference to, but it is a non-public organization. The public is not allowed to attend the meetings of the official management authority created by the courts to solve the management problems. It's a very odd situation that they would have created a non-public board that's not responsible to the public, and on which the public has no idea what they're doing because their minutes and whatnot aren't available to the public. Thank you uh, again for that point. But I, I, I would just say that the courts are the judiciary, and they're a third division of government, and we have limited say as to their uh, the decisions they make in jurisprudence. Legislative powers are limited. Uh, even for local governments, unless they're directed by the courts. Thank you very much. I believe we have this microphone working again, so our next question is going to come from Skip Herbert. Here you are. I, I know that you sit in the House of Representatives, not the Senate, but... Could no, you, no, no. for some reason, it's not working, is it? Hold it closer. Try really close. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, closer, yeah. Yeah, I know, uh, I, I'm saying that I know you sit in the House of Representatives, not the Senate, but non nonetheless, um, increasingly concerned with the deteriorating condition of our Senator, uh, Senator Feinstein. And I'm wondering, is there something the party can do to uh, cajole her to uh, retire? She, claims that she's going to retire after the end of her term. I don't think we can wait that long. Yeah, I think uh, that becomes a decision that she will have to make or reaches a point in her health where she um, uh, has to confront that issue. But it's something that uh, it's a decision she's going to have to make or that her family and her doctor and her make. Um, I certainly understand the concern. I, I think she has come back to Washington and she continues to vote. And it, it is a precarious circumstance. But I understand your concern. And I wish I could go into more of that, but being that this is an official uh, meeting, it's, it's hard to engage in such a discussion that has um, some ten tangents into the political arena. So. But I would just say that I think you raised some very valid points that I'm sure are being given consideration to by Senator Feinstein, her family, and her doctor. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Richard Klein regarding the IRS. Oh, Richard, thank you for doing this panel kind of all. Um, my wife and I are, are ranchers and farmers in Los Alamos. Um, <laughs> we found an enormous problem in dealing with the IRS and getting them to be responsive and responsible. Uh, Esmeralda was nice enough to take a, a, a letter from me that will give you the details. But to make a long story short, we uh, filed our taxes in March. We were told they were going to review it. Not audit, but review it. And we were getting a, a pretty substantial return, which we planned on using for property taxes. 
after hours on the phone with the IRS, getting no answer, and after, he may not even get reviewed until November. I mean, they've held our money for, a, we had prepaid taxes last year, so we, they've held our money for a year and a half, and they are telling us there is nothing we can do to get it. If we were a business running that way, we'd file a lawsuit and they'd be forced to pay us the money. With the IRS, we're getting nowhere. What can be done? You want to hear the good news? More responsive and responsive. I'd love to hear some good news. That's why I'm your representative and I'm going to go fight like hell to make sure you get the appropriate response sooner rather than later. Thank you. All right. I, we, we will greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And I, I know others are having similar problems. What? But like everyone else who contacts my office, it's my job and my staff to be your advocates. And we are going to get on that right away and hopefully get you a better result. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next question this evening comes from Stephen Simonson. I, um, I gave you a list of questions, but uh, for brevity's sake, I'm going to ask one. <laughs> and I was wondering, what is uh, your stand on Article 14, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution to keep insurgent Trump's name off the ballot? To keep who? Insurgent Trump. Oh. <laughs> I, you know, first of all, I, I, I wish I knew that section by heart. So let me look at that. Uh, I wish I could provide you a better response. Yeah. But you know, our democracy is such that uh, our government is clear on the rules of who can uh, get on the ballot, how you could get on the ballot. And those rules, unless they're changed, unless they're legal, provide for anyone and everyone to pursue those avenues, even if we don't like them, even if I don't like them. And so, um, as long as the law is followed, then I'm not sure that there's any recourse. Um, so I, let me look into that, because I'm not sure that I, you, you caught me flat-footed on that section, and I want to make sure that I fully understand it in terms of um, what you are referring to. Let's make sure we talk afterwards. For, uh, for the other people who may not be aware of what that is, that was passed after the Civil War. Anybody who is involved in insurrection or insurgent against the United States government cannot hold a political office or work for the federal government. That's what it is. Thank you for reminding me. And I would say that there are a number, a number of cases and indictments going forward that may or may not uh, be adjudicated soon. And that may then pose the question you are raising. If there is uh, an indictment outcome uh, uh, through a trial that dictates uh, felonies or what you're referring to, that question is certainly valid at that point in time. But until you get that outcome through the uh, court system, uh, I'm, again, until you have that, that addresses your question. And certainly, if, if, if the law is clear, as you have stated, which I tend to believe in, uh, what has to substantiate that is the outcome of the courts and one of the cases that is moving forward. Okay. Our next questions this evening will come from Timothy Town and Daniel Simon. Thank you for your question. Good evening. Um, first of all, I do want to pay your office a compliment because uh, concerning this next question, um, they have been very responsive. But uh, my Are you sure my staff didn't plant you? <laughs> I'm positive. Um, do you have concerns with the Santa Barbara SSDI's last place response resolution times? SSDI, uh, help me out. Social, social Security. Um, I have a uh, disability claim that was submitted two and a half years ago and uh, upon further research about that office um, they're in dead last place in the United States in terms of their response times and their turnaround times they're and which one is that is that which office is the that? Santa, Santa Barbara hearing office okay and your office has been in contact with them but I figured I would just take this opportunity while you're here face to face. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I'll go back with my staff and we'll see what that uh, communication has been. 
Okay. And I will give you my word that based on that discussion I have with my staff, I personally will place a call to the head of Social Security and let them know of your concern and the fact that uh, your case needs to be adjudicated. Please, thank you. Okay, remind me of that. I committed. Don't make me a liar, staff. <laughs> Our next question is from Daniel Simon, and then we have Ryan Santos. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Daniel Simon. I uh, am one year into being a Medicare beneficiary, and my question is about saving Medicare money. <clears throat> and uh, I have been in touch with your staff, but we haven't really found, and what I'm looking for is a place where there is either some sort of Medicare cost oversight committee or, or department. I've tried myself to get in touch with Medicare and find it, but I found myself with the first ever surgery this year, uh, shoulder surgery, after which I got a bunch of bills, and, it's, and one of them is for the sling, and it's just foam rubber and, you know, uh, Velcro, and I've looked online, they go between $9 and $130, and I got a bill five months later that shows that Medicare paid $806 off of an $1,044 bill. And I'm thinking to myself, I looked online, it could be true or not, there's 1.77 million arthroscopic surgeries per year, at $1,000 a piece is taking you to the billion level, at $1.7 billion, it's not nothing, but if, it, if they really should be paying more like 10% of that, then I, we'd be talking about saving, you know, one and a half billion dollars just on foam rubber. And I'm just asking myself, are we still paying $250 for a hammer in the military? I mean, I thought that scandal broke loose 30, 50 years ago, and that somebody is actually not asleep at the wheel of what the cost, cost should be for certain things. And I myself would volunteer in my almost retired state as an attorney for 40 years to help your office if I could be directly to the right people to write letters and to argue. It seems ludicrous that we're, that this is happening. It looks like my supplemental is getting billed for the extra $200. You know, I, I just can't believe Thank it. you. Thank you. A point well taken. Absolutely. I'm going to applaud you too. Um, I think you just highlighted uh, one of the major problems with our healthcare system in general, whether you're in private insurance or Medicare. And you're identifying uh, an exact reason why we need to continue to reform our healthcare system in a way that gets us to a better place. There's been many bills that have been put forward. forward. The Affordable Care Act did a lot of good. Did it fix it completely? No. Uh, there's been a lot of other bills that have been put forward, uh, Medicare for All, that would completely restructure our system. There's other bills that have been put forward. They're all very complicated, and they're all, they all would take a significant amount of collaboration between Republicans and Democrats to move those reforms forward. Let me tell you, having said that, as appalling as that is, Medicare is a model for the way they run on very little overhead. It's my understanding that Medicare, compared to the private insurances, runs with, a, I believe, if I remember correctly, a four or five percent overhead. And, and can I say that oh. one of the reasons that is, I think, is when I contacted Medicare, they said, oh, we, we don't get into that. That's a third party contractor problem. And, well, and let me, let me, let me finish. Yeah, let me finish. Yeah. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. So, um, Medicare, uh, we need to reform the system more, as I, as, I, as I need to say. Then we have Medicare Part A, B and C, and, all the, and it all depends on which one you're on as well. The bottom line is valid point. We need to continue to reform our healthcare uh, service delivery system. 
and we need to get there because there's still absurd um, absurd amount of costs uh, by our insurance companies and by various companies, and we need to get there and continue to inch our way to a better healthcare delivery system. But my specific question to your office was, could you and will you follow up on telling me there must be some department that looks at There is CMS, there is CMS, who really is like the managed care um, for costs associated for medicines and different procedures that authorizes uh, certain uh, visits, certain healthcare costs for Medicare. It's called CMS, we will get you the information, and I, believe me, I hear from doctors, we're not getting proper reimbursement. Um, CMS is not allowing telehealth visits. CMS is responsible and has that function you're talking about, okay. and we'll make sure we get that to you, okay? But point well taken. Thanks. Our next question comes from Ryan Santos, and this is the last slip that I have in my hand. So if you have a burning question to ask, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, you can grab one for Esme or... Um, You're a shy crowd, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Not even a controversial question? We love it. We wouldn't do that. Uh, thank you again for uh, visiting with us here today and uh, just uh, piggyback on what's been said a number of times here. Your staff does a great job of uh, getting uh, and com complex responses back to Well, thank you. And, and we very much Put it closer to your mouth, Santos. Oh, sure. Um, so, um, just out of curiosity here, um, so my wife and I were are products of the, the public school system here. Um, so much. But we are hesitant to put our kids into public, the public high schools um, in the area. We, uh, I am curious about whether or not if, uh, if there's funding available for um, uh, like charter schools or um, uh, like a magnet school within the Santa Maria proper area so that people that live in a town of like over 100,000 people doesn't have to, you know, uh, people that live there don't, don't have to send their, you know, uh, kids to like a St. Joe's or a New Tech, where they can work at an academy, um, where they can get a more challenging education um, for for high school. Uh, this is part. I have a second question after this, but I didn't get a chance to build it. All right, let me try to answer that one first. Well, first of all, uh, you know, the federal government has a limited role when it comes to education. Uh, locally with local school districts and state education standards. Uh, but the federal government does play a role. Um, the goal for all of us is always, how can we make our public education system better, more resilient, uh, meeting its responsibility, uh, addressing the concerns you have? And I think that's the number one goal, at least that I have, and that many people have. Um, certainly there's concerns, with any school, and you obviously are concerned about the local schools. And you do have an elected school board that you help elect who make those policies and are responsible for hiring the staff and making sure that your schools live up to its highest standards. I direct you to them as number one. Uh, in terms of funding for charter schools, that would have to come from the state. They have a charter school um, system or framework that communities need to follow if they're interested and meet certain criteria. It's still a public school, but you have to meet certain criteria by which you continue to make it an open and public school admittance process for everyone. It allows you to have, abide by a slightly different set of rules but it's very similar and it's still a public school. Uh, I would encourage you to look to your school board and look to your state of California to see what your options are. But um, the first thing is that your statement makes me sad, not because of you, because you have a valid point, if that's your concern, but we need to strive to make our public schools better and give confidence to our parents and our communities and make sure that the achievement of our children is one that makes us proud. And uh, that they're safe environments. Um, and, and so I hope we can get to a point where we can continue to make our public education 
better and stronger. I'm a product of public education, and uh, I hope we can continue to do better. Sorry, sorry. Um, it, can you use the mic? Um, oh, we sure. want to hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a school teacher. So in Santa Maria, I live in Santa Maria. I think, I don't know, I am always doing my best to go above and beyond and provide a challenging curriculum to my students. A lot of the problem is the size of these classes. I have 32 third graders. That, and last year I had 31. So, I mean, I Point don't well know taken. if that's a school board. I, what, what could we do? I mean, a lot of that too is, we, I can't get to all my students the way that I want to. Um, I mean, I don't, you, and we've talked about school size at our school board meetings. Let me share with you that those decisions of school size, classroom size, is state funding issues and local uh, school board issues. Uh, I wish the federal government had more say. The federal government steps in when children and families' civil rights are not being addressed through the education system. So if they were to see something extremely lopsided where the data bears it out, the federal government, I think the state would first be the one to do that. But the federal government might have a role in those issues. But it would have to be a very egregious situation. Uh, but I would say, uh, I'm, I wish I could give you a better answer. Work with your state uh, secretary of education, your state superintendent of education, and your local school board. I wish I had a better answer for you. Okay, just All right. I wanted to hear <laughs> I, I, you know, um, I have two uh, children. Uh, one's a lot older now, and one is uh, a young man, uh, 22 and 37. And uh, one went to parochial school for a number of years, and then went to public school for the rest of her high school years. And my son went to public school all his, his uh, entire um, 12 years. And uh, I, I understand the, the concerns. We as parents, all of you as parents, right? We want the best for our kids. And every once in a while when we think there's something that's not maybe less than or not doing as great, we're, we're concerned. And so I understand your concern. Uh, keep speaking out. Speak to your school board. Keep doing the great job you're doing as a teacher. And um, I still want to be hopeful. Thank you. Sorry, my, my second question. Oh, I knew it was coming. <laughs> Um, you were waiting so patiently. <laughs> so this is more of an overall national question for you. Um, so the student loan forgiveness thing that Biden was trying to put into place was, to me, in my opinion, more of a band-aid fix for people that have already gone to college. I, I feel, and others surround me feel, that there's got to be a, a, a bigger solution out there that can solve the exponentially increasing costs that come with going to college and it's absolutely absurd uh, about uh, of how much it costs to attend a public school um, the the UCs and CSUs are some of the best colleges best universities in the country but I mean, looking into it, it costs like 30 grand a year to go to Cal Poly that that's not acceptable what can you and your office do is there something like a bill that you can put out to? I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> well, the you're, and I know why you're asking. You're saying you're the one in Congress, so you better give me some answers. <laughs> let me let me try to answer that in a in a very broad way. First of all, I was lucky, and my wife was lucky, and uh, my daughter. We all uh, had an opportunity to go to college. My son as well, even though he's taking a sabbatical, and. My daughter had student debt. I paid for some of her education. She had student debt. My wife had student debt. As a matter of fact, we're still paying on some of my wife's Sorry. student debt. I had student debt. I paid all my student debt. Um, I understand. And it is a band-aid what President Biden tried to do, but he tried to do something. Something. And then you had the people that said, well, wait a minute, I paid for mine. Why should somebody get free of this? And I understand that too. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just really trying to help uh, it, 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 those individuals that are struggling. We have more 
student debt in our nation than credit card debt. Is that alarming? And it is ludicrous that you have to pay such huge amounts of funding to just get a public education. Forget about the private schools, right? All the ones that are super expensive. So I understand, and I, I share with you my own life story, so you know I can relate. I certainly understand. Um, I have sponsored a bill called Degrees Not Debt Act, which would double the Pell Grant. It would index it for inflation so that we could at the very least provide more financial aid to people which would reduce how much loans you have to get. So it would help, that's one, again, it's a band-aid, it's not the solution. Personally, I think we need to find a way to make loans for people that do have to take loans, if they do, to make sure that it's at a very low interest, very low interest. And to expand the loan forgiveness program for people who work in certain public interest jobs. We already have that program for nurses, police officers, uh, and we've, we've expanded that for people who work in certain nonprofits, public interest uh, jobs. And then if you work in that area, you're able to have a lot of your student debt r r r um, uh, forgiven, but at the same time, you're helping our community. Uh, if you're a police officer, like our wonderful officer in the back, He's putting his life on the line, working in this very risky, difficult job to protect the public. We should be able to do what we're doing for our law enforcement and our fire and our teachers. Um, so we, we could expand that program, one. We could find a way of making sure that loans are minimized because we're providing more financial aid. And loans that are provided one, they can be forgiven, and two, that we reduce the interest rate. Because the interest rate should never be beyond enough to pay for the cost of administering the loan. Right? right. Nobody should make money on people trying to go to college. Right. Loan them the money, pay the money back, but very low interest rate. Just to pay enough for the administration at the most. Right? Yeah. All right. I hope that helps. It's not, a, it's not the, the panacea, but it helps a little bit. We have one more question in the back. Yes, we have two questions, one coming from David and one from Kenneth before we wrap for the evening. So here's David. Thank you, Representative. It's real nice to be here and hear you speak. Um, let me just kind of piggyback on that, um, that last bit of conversation. Um, Wait a minute, David. Is that Lawanda Pruitt, the woman of the year, the congressional woman of the year? I don't know. Uh, she's wearing a mask. I just want to recognize her. I didn't even know. Of course, I'm coming out to support my congressman and his office because y'all, I refer people to you all the time. <laughs> call Congressman Cabo's office. And we get results, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very and you've been very responsive to me and my questions already in the past. Um, let me piggyback on that last conversation. Is there any appetite in Congress and is there any discussion about when we get into these loans that are not at the end, it's a lot like maybe mortgage loans, where a house doesn't end up being worth what you had to take the loan out to pay for, even after all the, all the discussion. When you get a degree like that and, you keep, and the market doesn't support work to pay that loan back, can't we have a discussion with the lenders on that end to adjust their prices and to negotiate? Well, I think you're in luck because I think President Biden, after the, the, the courts, the Supreme Court said that you can't do what you wanted to do in, in, through your forgiveness program that you had proposed. He basically took a step back and said, okay, then I'm gonna do it based on a need of families. I'm gonna be, families don't have to pay more than a certain amount of their income. I don't care what the circumstance is for your student loans. So he attempted to do that through an executive order. And I believe that's what's in place, but it's a similar concept to what you're uh, speaking about. And again, 
all of those creative ideas are worth considering. It, yeah, it's time to, the back end of the deal needs to get looked at, and they need to move sometimes. I agree. I wish I had a wand and I could make Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, come together and solve all our problems. But you know what? I do believe in Santa Claus sometimes. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, a few observations. Town hall meetings are vital and very important. <coughs> Last week, I attended the San Rio Philharmonic in this room. It was standing room only. The town hall meeting is so important, and we have so many vacant seats. That is of concern to me. Me too. The, the questions and concerns here are very honest and very valid. But my observation is voter apathy. So many people who are registered to vote and don't vote. And that's a big concern why we have so many questions like we have today. Regarding student loans, all the time we tend to look to Washington for answers. I reversed that. 20 years ago, another classmate and I started a scholarship at our high school. And we did 20 years in a row, we awarded scholarships to students. You have to look to yourself. You have to take the issue on your own hands and make a difference. And that's how you're going to get things done. In the 20 years, we've awarded over $140,000, $5,000 in scholarships. You have to look to yourself. Don't necessarily always look to Washington for answers. If everybody who graduated high school donated just $25 a year to their high school scholarship program, scholarship student loans would be a lot less if you did that nationwide. Town hall meetings, like I said, are very important. And for the lack of empty seats here, that's a deep concern to me. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Very, very valid point. Very valid point, and I agree with you. Uh, there's a lot of apathy, and you know, we try, we outreach, and we try to get as many people here as possible. It's a good showing, but you're right. It would be great if it was full to the gills. So uh, thank you for raising those issues. And thank you for reminding us that government can't solve everything for us. We all have some personal responsibility to step up and do things. So thank you very much. Is that it? Yes. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm very grateful for your time. I'm very grateful for you coming. Let me just close by saying a couple things. As part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, $500 million has already come to the Central Coast. There are, there are uh, for example, $200 million for roads, bridges, and highways. $14.8 million for airports. $49 million for free, clean water, pro water projects. $26 million to close orphan wells. Never knew we had orphan wells in the area, right? $7 million for the Santa Maria Transit. $6.6 million for buses for Santa Maria, low emission buses. $2 million for Santa Maria Airport. $3.2 million for repairs on State Route 35. 1.85 million to help the replacement of the Bonita School Road Bridge and 1.6 million for repairs on State Route 135. I'm not done. And 40 million dollars in 23 projects throughout the Central Coast, including $500,000 to support the construction of the Santa Maria Japanese Community Center, one million dollars for construction and equipment needs at Marion Regional Medical Center, Obstetrics and Gynecology Center. Two million five hundred dollars for the Escalante Meadows a Community Center in Guadalupe. One point seven million for the Leroy Park in City of Guadalupe. Nine hundred thousand dollars for the Lompoc Health Clinic. One point two million dollars 
for Lompoc's Pioneer Park, $2 million for the Orca Santa Barbara County Library, and I could go on and on, and I'm privileged to represent you in Washington. Thank you.